This episode of Capes and Lunatics is brought to you by Tweaked Audio. To get awesome headphones, go to tweakedaudio.com and use the coupon code SOUTHGATE to get 30% off, free shipping, and a lifetime warranty. Or you can get there through the link on our website, southgatemediagroup.com. Last me hearties and welcome once again to full stream ahead. Arg! I am your captain, Curly the Professor Esser, and with me as always is me skinny rich friend. It's Maz. Hey, Mazzy. Oh, I keep on disappearing here. I'm stuck on my ghost ship. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Maz. Welcome once again to full stream ahead and the final episode of. The Mandalorian. <coughs> okay. Let's you may want to switch to the other headset because, yeah. yeah. No, the other headsets. Oh, oh there we are. There we yes, are. Much better. Yeah. It's, they don't work as well on the computer. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Anyway, welcome to Full Stream Ahead, everybody. Uh, so glad you joined us. This is the final episode of this season of The Mandalorian, uh, The Mandalorian, Season 2, Episode 8, Chapter 16, The Rescue. The Mandalorian and his allies attempt a daring rescue. Director is Peyton Reed. Writers are Jean Favreau and Jean Favreau. And, of course, based on characters by, uh, based on Star Wars by George Lucas. Not even characters... Yeah, um, I don't know how much. Yeah. No problem. Thank you, Tristan. So, yes, Tristan wanted me to wear the helmet, so you all got to see the helmet. Uh, hopefully the sound quality was not too bad. <laughs> Doable. Mm. Gets us through the scene. Uh, right. <laughs> oh, goodness. So, Maz, this is... I have to say, I'm a little disappointed Mayfield doesn't show up in this. I am too, but 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 they gave us enough for me to still be hungry for more Mayfield. Oh, and yeah, who knows yeah. what we'll get, Mayfield and Cara Dune and, you know, um, some yeah. other spinoff series. Uh, I definitely think he's going to be back. Yeah, well, you know we're going to get uh, uh, Ming-Na uh, Wen and Cara Dune. I'm forgetting Ming-Na Wen's character um, right now. But you know they're going to be back because they're going to be at odds at some point since Cara Dune has got the badge now. True, true. You know, this is the thing. It's like, you know. I, I feel it's going to be one of those where they start out uh, at odds, but then in the end, Cara Dune's like, yeah, you know, take your thing and get off. I'll hold them off. You hope, unless Cara Dune's sent to go bring her in, you know. That's the thing. It's like, we know from the final, the after credit scene, we haven't seen the last of Mina Wen, and we know she is not on the side of the angels. You know what I mean? That we know. I mean, Boba has his code, and she's. You well, know. yeah, but it's well. So here's what I'll say. So as I've said, okay. So spoilers for the end of this. If you did not watch the whole episode yet, please watch it. Why are you here? Yeah, why are you here? <laughs> it's been out for a while. We're, we're we're a little late to the game. No, on this. but what I mean is like, I mean, you come watch these things once you've seen the episode for a little bit yeah. more insight. So. Yeah. Um. But in that moment, at the end, we do get that. Next next December, and this has been stated, next December, in the Mandalorian's time slot, or possibly with the Mandalorian, will be the Book of Boba Fett. And we see that Mengna and Boba Fett basically just took over the Hutt's palace. Now, I'm going to be very interested to see what happens with this. I really want to see if we get more Hutt's. Because I like the huts. I actually, this is what I've always said, you know, when, when Jabba's mad about, um, uh, about Han dumping the cargo mm -hmm. that gets him frozen, um, it is, it, it is, it is because those were, he was, uh, he was running guns. And you don't need to run guns 
to the Empire. The Empire has guns. They're fine. They don't need you to run them guns. They don't need you to smuggle guns to the Empire. He's smuggling guns to the rebels. So, at a nice profit, of course. But still, the fact of the matter is, is Jabba the Hutt is the unsung hero of the Rebellion. Most likely, every phaser, every X-Wing they got, it all came through Hutco, uh, a subsidiary of Hutt's Enterprises. Well, I mean, the huts clearly are serving a purpose much similar to, sort of similar to what you might consider the Ferengi in the Star Wars universe, where they're not necessarily the makers of things, although they can make things too, but they are, they are mostly sellers of things. They are a culture that's based on commerce and the glories of commerce, as, as noble as freaking uh, the Klingons and the, and the glories of war, mm. you know. And I will say this: I would rather live in a world of commerce than a world of war. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I mean, when you really think about it, at the end of the day, it's like, you know, at least nobody dies at the end of the business deal. Maybe somebody loses right. their house, but at least nobody killed you. You know. <laughs> right. I'd rather die in glorious bankruptcy than glorious uh, battle. But that's my opinion. What's yours? But um, so exactly what role the so I'm really interested to see now that. Uh, at the end of this, that Boba has taken over Jabba's palace, if because Jabba does have a son, if we see other huts coming in to challenge him next year. So that's going to be interesting. That's the question. Who's going to want to take over Hut's palace? Who's going to want to take over basically what I assume is sort of a de facto governorship? Or maybe that's what will happen. Like at the end of the season, you get Mando coming back to help him you know, ward off any uh, would-be usurpers. Yeah. And then we get, you know, leading into the next season, we get uh, Mando back. Maybe. We'll see. Or Cara Dune or Mayfield. Mayfield, right. I think, is the real likely guy to show up there. I can absolutely ah. see Mayfield showing up. That, that'd see, be great. You know, that's the thing. It's not like he's a good guy now. <laughs> you know, he's right. a hired gun. You know, and they let him go free. So he's... Prob- it's not like he's going to stay on that planet and become a farmer. Right. You know, he's going to go live a life and he's going to do what he can do, which is, I'm really right. good at shooting things. That's my skill. That's what I got to sell. So, right. Right. Um, yeah, I expect to see Mayfield back. Who, or, you know, I mean, because it's not like he's going to wind up a, a marshal, although maybe that's like his big redemption arc, arc is that he sets himself up as like the local gunslinger on that planet, then he gets to be a marshal. That'd oh. be funny. I like that. That sounds fun to me. Well, you know, a lot of gu- you know, when you think about your old west stereotypes, that idea of the the, the hired gun who becomes a marshal—that's not unheard of, you know. Yeah, now, I, I like that for Mayfield. I think that'd be fun. That would be fun. That would be fun. But you know, that's that. That is just the end cap, end credit scene. Let's talk mm. about the rest of the film. So we're gonna do the raid on the Star Cruiser that uh, Gideon is in. And part of this is they have to capture the tri-wing that, uh, that the scientist is in. Why the scientist is in there, it's never given. It's never, he, they know he's there, but, you know, as we know about the Empire, even in the, they have really bad password security. No, <laughs> so it's an old code, but it checks out. You know? One, two, three, four. <laughs> yes. You know, it's like they just, they want to know if they, they, they ask, are you a, uh, in the rebellion? It's like, no. Okay, then come on in. <laughs> They're very, very nice about that. But um, they basically kidnap our doctor, and I forget the doctor's name. Um, hmm. um, let's tell my MDB open. Uh, doctor. Doctor Pershing, that's his name. I knew he had a weird name. Um, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt, named after Black Jack Pershing, the famed uh, American general. Interestingly enough, oh. uh, uh, yeah. So you know, who knows? Um, uh, they capture Doctor Pershing, and you know, it's sort of the Von Brownian quality of Doctor Pershing. The idea that you know he's just all about the science. He really doesn't care who's fine. Right. Right. But also doesn't care if he has to commit, you know, 
atrocities to do it. <laughs> you know, he's a clone engineer. You know, it's that's where the we, science is being done. That's where I need to be if I want to be at the forefront of discovery. Mm -hmm. And there's some pleasant things that go along with it. But you know, they would go yeah. along without my presence. And if someone has to be in the presence, might as well be me. That's a very good point, Mr. Winsler. Um, you know, it's, um, if I didn't do it, someone else would. And, right. that and, is and, and, and when it comes to points of, you know, where you need to make a choice, um, maybe Grogu's alive because this person was in that position instead of somebody else. Yeah. Although it seems like they wanted Grogu alive. They never really wanted Grogu dead. They just... No. I got the sense that he was the one holding back the onslaught of saying, take all his blood. And he's saying, no, look, 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 look. If we yeah. take little by little, we can keep him alive and we can continue to get samples. And, like, I'm sure some uh, overzealous person would have been like, no, 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 just get the blood, get the organs too. Let's see, you know. Yes. So uh, I like to yes. think that maybe he's been watching over Grogu. Um, maybe, he's, maybe he's a better person than he seems. And maybe we'll see him back next season. We don't know. <laughs> uh, Pershing doesn't die at the end of this. You know, in fact, I think Pershing probably just winds himself up at a, uh, you know, a rebel prison, much like Mayfield at the start of this, you know, just <laughs> tearing apart old, uh, old TIE fighters. Um, probably too valuable to waste that way. If you have him in your grasp, you use him for what he's good for. So you think they paperclip him? You know, just the whole. Well, you know, we know you're a Nazi scientist, but you know what? Right now, right. you're part of the. Now you're part of right. the, the Republic. I just give you a nice clean dossier. Um, you know, let's see if you can grow. grow maybe you can grow us a few Groku. Uh, Grogu's. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that is that is that. So, um, but they do. They capture Persian. They go. They invade the ship. They invade a uh, Moff Gideon's ship. Um, and then starts the big fight. And it is, it's interesting because, of course, you know, you have, um, you have Cara Dune and, uh, Bo-Katan and... Her Fennec sidekick. Shan. Yeah, Bo-Katan, her sidekick. Uh, I don't think I have her name here. Um, although it's a, it's a nice little, um, you know, uh, oh, actually even before that, oh, I gotta, I gotta step back to get that scene, uh, where they actually re recruit bo -Katan. And you get a real back and forth between Boba and her, where he says, you know, you know, it's my father's armor. He says, don't you mean your donor's armor? Yeah, like, you're you know, not I a Mandalorian. I never yeah. said I was. <laughs> exactly. And, but, you know, it's, it also reminds you what a short period of time all of the Skywalker story takes place in. Hmm. You know, and I think people often forget that because it actually seemed like it was a long time for us, but really between the fall of the Empire and the rise of the First Order and the fall of the Republic and the entire existence of the Empire, it's pretty much real time. It's like a few years. It's like, you know, you know, it's like, as people say, you know, Justin Bieber has been part of American culture longer than the, than the Confederacy. You know, uh, the Nazis existed for less time than than beanie babies you know that's you know this is this is the truth that we often overlook in these kinds of things that for whatever for whatever emperor palpatine did it basically existed for the entire lifespan of luke skywalker in the first film wow. that, you know by the end of by the time luke skywalker is probably in his mid-20s the entire empire has been destroyed so a galactic empire completely dismantled in that time because the empire rises when Luke Skywalker is born. And he's still, by the, by the time we see him again at the end of this, it, he's still this young guy. He's still a guy probably at most in his 30s, but probably in his early 20s. You know, he's a teenage farm boy when he starts. By the end of it, he's, you know, late 20s and that's the empire. It really did not last that long. And really the fact of the matter is, is that what allowed the Empire to rise was that it was built on the questionable practices of the Republic long before it, you know, which is why the Rebellion is in, or the New Republic is in such disarray because they, they don't have an Empire to build upon. They kind of, they're kind of like after, they're kind of like, um, you know, Iraq after the fall of Saddam and suddenly there's a, 
you know, you do a debathification, and suddenly now, well, yeah, that guy was part of the bath party, but he was also the accountant. And we actually do need more accountants, and we do need more cops, and we do need all these people. And if we're going to separate out the bad people, how do we get this empire, how do we get the Republic to work without this, without the support staff? Because as we've said, you know, the, the Republic was, you know, had clone labs and doing all these things, had slaves and all these things long before the Empire arose. So most of the guys in the Republic, they were just accountants. They were just, you know, random moths doing their job day to day. Some were evil. Um, you know, a lot of people were in the military. They were admirals and, and, and what have you. And then all of a sudden one day, now, oh, now, uh, one of the senators now says he's the emperor. Okay, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I still have to do my job. And then it all falls, and now suddenly with the rise of the rebellion, it's a little more slipshod, which, of course, is exactly where the, the huts should be taking over. But, of course, you know, Jabba got, got killed at the end of Empire Strikes Back. So, you know, there's no, there's no hut boss in charge, which is how... Um, uh, it seems like Snakehead somebody guy. spilled the beans and they're just trying to catch up and pick all the pieces up. They're collecting yeah. intention you know, from all these little areas saying, we got where, we got you. You got us too, right? Yeah. Although, to that end, you know, I think maybe if there is a moral of the story to take away, it's that, you know, they're doing their best and the Empire is in disarray, but right now is the time when guys like um, a, a hut can rise in, in stature. This is the chaos when a local warlord can sort of establish themselves as, well, actually, you know what? I'm actually going to be in charge of this. And I'll work with the Republic as I need to. I'll work with whatever's left of the Empire as I need to. Because day to day, planet to planet, everybody just does their job. Hmm. And whether you're under the Republic or you're under the Empire, you know, as can be pointed out, you know, tattoo, Tatooine was still a hive of scum and villainy under the Empire. It's, you know, when people like to say, oh, yes, but look how chaotic and dangerous our world is now that the Empire has fallen. It's like, were you here last week? You know, <laughs> were you here before the Empire fell? It was always this. Um, but our heroes get on the ship. Uh, they go, you know, hall by hall, a lot of shooting. We get a nice uh, ladies doing it um, scene. Because that's our. Because ever since the end game scene with all the women, all the female characters doing their girl power stance, everyone wants to do that, and everyone does it better. I think. I think the boys did it better. I think this show did it a lot better because it's that not one this, scene where they do that uh, almost a WWE tag team move where she reels them in with her grappling hook, and the other girl comes in and like knees the dude in the in, in the chest. That's yeah. pretty awesome. Well, that's pretty awesome. I mean, the fight choreography on these shows is not going to say. I actually think sometimes the stuff that's for streaming, and we think back to stuff like The Defenders and Daredevil, I think the fight choreography is so much better in those things than we get in the big movie theaters. Because I think that when they do the big movie, they want to do the open air scenes. And you get the basic, you know, why doesn't Spider-Man do more stuff in Queens, it's like, well, because there's not any building for him to swing off of. Mm. <laughs> you know? It's like you need you need the close quarters to really do a fight well. Yeah. That the more open air it is, it just becomes a punching match. But no, it's so, suddenly someone can run up the wall scene and, from Daredevil yeah. or the prison scene from Punisher. Or was that also from Daredevil? It was a Punisher exactly. scene. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's that yeah that's also Daredevil that, yeah um, they had really good fight scenes in Daredevil um, although you know not for nothing you know I do think they had a, a few good ones with Luke Cage and with yeah. um, Jessica Jones too and you know and probably a few that were actually really nice with um, Iron Fist although I think in those they're all, all a little bit more stylized because they are all professional martial artists as the idea. So you're going to have more that are more strictly punching battles rather than, you know, doing a lot of the... Yeah, I, I, mean, I hate to so continue bragging on Iron Fist, but a lot of their, their fight sequences <laughs> looked choreographed as opposed to, you know, I was pulled out of the reality of the situation by saying, oh, they yeah. look like they're doing a somersault and blah, blah, you know, so it's like, 
a little bit not as polished mm-hmm. as it was in the other shows. Yeah, and and, I, and like I said, I think that might have been a, a conscious choice because, as I said, I think they're supposed to be, you know, it's sort of like, and this is a thing, uh, we'll talk about this when we talk about uh, Wonder Woman later, although before, for those of you listening, you know, that Amazons prepare for war, they never actually go to war. And so I'm sure, in a lot of ways, you know, in uh, Kun Lun, they're learning to fight, but they almost never actually fight someone. Right. You know, it's fighting within the rules and the structures and the requirements of the fight. That's um, why you see in China there's a big thing of, like, all these kung fu masters getting beat up by MMA fighters. They show up yeah. and then they get destroyed. And they're like, wait a second, I thought this was supposed to work. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, because, well, you know, this, this, was, this was, you know, Bruce Lee's whole thing. It's like, you know... You can fight, but that's not how you fight, you know? Right. That the rules of Kung Fu are rules, but there are no rules in a fight. So you have to be like the water, as Bruce mm. Lee would say. Which is why he really dominated that field. Right. Um, and as I'd say, he was the only person or even the first person to come up with that idea. But that sort of, and of course, anytime that any fighting style gets too ritualized, it tends to to limit its effectiveness in a fight. You know, um, that's, you know, that's, yeah. that's just my opinion. But anyway, um, you know, boxers are great. I would not want to get into a fight with Mike Tyson even now. Good Lord. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that if you're, you know, fighting by the rules, there are very specific moves you can and can't do. And that right. makes it a little harder. But um, as they're going through, what they, what they need to establish in this is, you know, bo and her team and all, all the other people are going to take the bridge. Uh, uh, Din Djarin is going to find uh, Grogu, and that's, the, that's how they're splitting the forces. And they have to somehow stop the Dark Troopers, because they know that they've turned down the Dark Troopers, and the Dark Troopers are coming, and this is our, our threat of the week. Right. And um, we see they, that... that um, uh, Din Djarin, uh is able to lock the stormtroop, the, the dark troopers before they come out, but one gets out, and then we get this really, I, I think a really pretty, a really good robot fighting match, mm-hmm. um, where he has to de- defeat this guy um, with his um, his uh, best car uh, spear. And so, he, what are these guys made out of? Hard it was. How hard it. I'm, I lost you for a second. I keep wondering, you know, what the uh, what the dark troopers are made of, because at some point, you know, I lost you for a second. Could okay. You... Yeah. So I'm wondering if that's a bug or a feature that the um, that uh, you know that the dark troopers are all kept in a room that can be, you know, ejected at one moment. So that if if you ever do have a um, problem with them, you can just get rid of them all right away. Right, either that or that's where they launch to go to missions. You know. I mean, yeah, I guess that's a possibility too. Because um, in the, the end, we works, end up it, seeing it, it, that they're it, perfectly fine. They're not going to go out into the cold, you yeah. know, vacuum of space and implode or uh, you know freeze and break apart or nothing. They're they're made to handle this. So I mean, yeah, I, and that, you know, that, like that's a, what I'm saying. I'm not sure if it's a bug or a feature. I, I would say it's a feature. It's a feature that they, that that's what that's my blow them all out. The, oh, not blow them all out, but that's where they that was to go to. You know, they say, okay, go yeah. to the planet surface, or go take over the ship, or okay, you're not going to like go out into a hallway, get into an elevator, and then blah blah blah. Just open the door, and let them fly out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess I can see that, especially if you're trying to be super efficient with your energy mm-hmm. resources, because we know that they have really difficult ba- battery problems. Right. Um, but what are they made of? They are made of probably Durasteel, which is the Beskar alloy. Okay so, so, okay, so when he's punching Din Djarin in the face, right, the helmet right. doesn't bend or, or, or you know, uh, dent yeah. at all because it's made of Beskar. Uh, the wall behind him dents, but the droid hands, when he's punching him, don't show any effect either, leading yeah. me to think that they're also made of Beskar. But then, 
you know, a lightsaber goes through them like it's nothing. So, like, yes. Well, that is also possibly what 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 you deal with in focusing on joints, because that's the thing. It's like you know, yeah, lightsaber can't go through Beskar, but you know, um, uh, what's but his name? A lightsaber uh, did seem to go through these droids without a problem, you know. So it yeah, must not yeah. have been Beskar or something. No, but yeah. then how did it stand up to the Beskar when it was enough force to dent something else behind well, because it? Because it's still, it's still, so, it, and it's sort of, um, the, 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 the metallurgical idea is, so if, if we're assuming it's Durasteel, which I'm, which I believe is supposed to be a steel Beskar alloy, where you're infusing Beskar into the steel to make it to be almost as strong as Beskar, but it's not as strong as Beskar. But then if it's like, so if, let's say that Duracell has half the strength of Beskar, then if you have two inches of Duracell, that's as strong as one inch of Beskar, roughly. All right. All right. And so that's the idea, that they have these joints. And, you know, for what it's worth, you know, um, you know, the hands may not be being damaged by hitting uh, um, Beskar. Beskar, but it also doesn't mean that they weren't, um, you know, it, essentially it's like, you know, when you get, w- when you get into a car accident, you know, and one car doesn't have any damage, but the other car is totaled. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this, but the idea is, is that, you know, that there could have been much more damage than you saw just because you didn't see it, you know, Fair enough. but, and when, when you, you talk, cause again, it's the best car spirit, putting the CPU in the head. Of any robot design, it's like it's you know. There's no reason just to not make it a box, right? You know, right. I always remember when you ever watch um like the the robot fights. It's there's always like that one big box robot that just has a big hammer stuck to it. Yeah, and those very always nice dominate. Design. Nothing complicated. Don't make it humanoid. Why do the eyes have to be up there? Shouldn't it have sensors and cameras all over in its feet, in its knees, in its chest, yeah. and its you know, in its back? Um. The insistence yeah. on having giving extent, it human vision is silly. Exactly. And I think they do do stuff that goes beyond that with this. And this is actually an interesting theory I have about Astromex, which is whether or not they are putting – Astromex are the R2-D2 type droids, ah. uh, the BB-8, you know, the ones that are that, – that never get their minds wiped, interestingly enough, and are very communicative – with their pilots, because these are the guys that basically are doing the work of the flying for the pilots. And I do wonder if they have some organic material in them, hmm. because I think one of the things they were doing with Grogu and getting his midichlorians is I think they were infusing the dark troopers with some forced sensitivity, because that's why when the ah. mysterious stranger shows up at the end, they all stop. Because they huh. sense that. They know that something just showed up that is problematic for them. Because if you think about it, they're just punching through a door. There's no right. reason for them to know that somebody just, that's, you know, one lone X Wing just docked on the far side of the ship. You know? Yeah. But they all stop because they know, oh, this is the bigger threat. This is what we have to deal with now. Because you really, they could, like, if they just said, oh, someone just docked, we'll send half of our, half of our guys there. We're going to continue punching through the door that they all stopped punching through the door. It's because they knew how much of a threat that was because they felt that this was a force user. And hmm. droids typically can't sense the force because they're not organic. Right. But if you were to... But as we know, there are cybernetic beings and all life has the force flowing through it. So it means that anything that can be alive can feel the force flow through it can and you you know basically you can you can do the science of it you know you can work right. out how these Pershing things- says though Pershing says though that the last bit of weakness they had to remove was the human element so there's maybe- a lot of things that aren't human that are alive oh that's fair you know all you need is a all you need is a is essentially all you need is anything that can that is organic to keep the midichlorians going so imagine if they pulled out like uh, an organ or a heart or something and mm-hmm. there's a box in there that, that artificially keeps it pumping and that blood somehow goes through and lubricates certain portions of where it's um, not nerve endings but whatever sensory sort of communicative wires or pathways there are. And with that, the force-sensitive cells 
can buzz electronically to the point exactly. where this thing can feel it. And oh, that's so fascinating. Yeah, and that well, this is now this is pure headcanon. This is just my idea, but I think I think that that technology has existed for a while because I think there is an organic component to Astromex, which is why mm-hmm. Astromex are able to communicate so well with their human pilots in a way that I don't think that protocol droids can. I think protocol droids are just droids. Same thing with you know any other dro- any any other bipedal droid. But I think when you get to the Astromex, I get the feeling that they're designed w- to maintain some kind of an, or an organic system that allows them to better communicate with um, with their hosts or with their mm-hmm. with their pilots. Um, uh, and j- just a theory, but I think that might be something that they're building towards. And I think that idea of that Astromech technology, what if we could make our death troopers force sensitive? And, you know, I think that worked out. I mean, I think I think it worked out coolly, and the way that the fight scene goes is really good. Uh, before that, we do have, effectively, um, the big fight between uh, uh, Din Djarin and yeah. Moff Gideon. Yeah. And that is quite a fight. Um, and we get to see the Darksaber in use. Against and Beskar. He, and against Beskar. And this is the thing. People are saying, oh, the Darksaber... Because here, when when we see the 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 spear against a uh, dark saber, the Beskar starts to glow, which it didn't when um, Ashokatan was fighting um, the lady who had the Beskar spear beforehand. It didn't glow when she hit it. It would just basically deflect the. Right, but there was was there any sustained contact, or was it just like a glancing sort of? Ah, uh, you know, I don't remember exactly, but. People start to say, "Oh, so the light, so the dark saber can pierce Beskar," and that's not what we see. No, because it, it tried; it got close, but not quite. Yeah. What it can do is it, is it can heat Beskar up, and Beskar can be heated. And this is actually something that I think people misunderstand about Beskar, because people say, "Oh, well, you know, if you can melt Beskar, why can't a laser blast do it? it?" You know, like if it's just in a forge, if you can forge Beskar, then why can't you do this with Beskar? I don't think we ever see anyone forge Beskar. We see that Beskar is a super don't, helpful... Don't we see them melt it down in, in the first season? Yes, yes, yes. But that's casting. That's not forging. What's the difference between casting and forging? Well, well and you can forge... So when you forge something, it, essentially it's when you're building it. So you're taking... So when you take iron and you're hammering it to turn it into steel, okay? What you're doing is you're, you're heating up the iron and then you're infusing it with carbon to build steel, and you're hammering it and shaping it. And that's a different process than when you're just casting something. So that's, it has to be completely melted and into a mold, essentially, exactly. instead of beating it into something. Yeah, and that is what we see. Now, you can also heat something up, and you can like hammer it to bend it a little bit, but we don't see anyone ever actually really working with Beskar the way that you would work with iron. Interesting. Beskar is too... Heavy of an element. It's more similar to the way that they've described adamantine or adamantium in Marvel Comics, which is that once it hardens, you know, it's it's hard. You're done. It's, that's its shape. You're not going to change its shape anytime soon. You know, you can't hit it with a hammer. You can't turn it into something else unless mm. you're able to actually reliquify it. And I think that's what happens with Beskar. Now, I can see someone liquefying Beskar and then folding that into steel to make dura steel and i can see people using beskar in that way to make stronger and stronger metal alloys but pure beskar i get the feeling is like it's like titanium you know it's just a super hard element that you're just not going to to easily bend or break at best that, that, that raises some interesting questions about how beskar is mined like, do they have to, like, excavate everything around, like, this, you know, football field size deposit and then lift the whole thing out? But then if it can't be broken, how do you break it? How do you, you know? Well, no. Well, what you would do, it's the same way that actually most metals are. Because like, it's like when you pull gold out of the ground, it's not like gold. When they say gold ore, it's usually, sometimes you'll get a vein, but usually you have the gold mixed into another rock. And you have to essentially heat it up to melt the gold out of it. Now, fortunately... Right, but if Beskar... Well, okay, I got you. Yeah. 
So essentially, and then what you can do is like when you melt it sometime, and when you and you do this with iron, the impurities rise to the top. The mm-hmm. denser metal goes to the bottom, and the lighter metal goes to the top. I think they it's something similar they do with aluminum when they melt down aluminum because aluminum has an incredibly high melting point. Little known fact, um, yeah. which is why you don't see, which is why uh, silver is used more in the ancient room world than aluminum because they had no idea what aluminum was because it was too hard to get. That's, you know, when everyone says, you know, gold is the most valuable thing because, you know, for whatever reason, but actually it was, no, that was just the most common shiny element, they uh, shiny metal they could find. They mm. liked shiny metals. This was actually a really common, easy to use shiny metal. It wasn't even that it was the rarest shiny metal. In fact, if it had been more rare, it wouldn't have been as valuable. But it was just a good shiny metal to use as a mo- mode of commerce that they could use. It is mm. rare, don't get me wrong. It's not like there's, you know... But, right, even, but it had to be enough supply for it to be used. Exactly. I mean, truth be told, if they could have made glass metal, I mean, you know, if they could have made glass earlier in history, that might have been what it is, because there is a lot of glass. What they wanted was they wanted something that could... They wanted something pretty and shiny, and that could be exchanged, so... Right. Ah, uh, hindsight, you know. <laughs> the moral of the story is nothing is of value, right. um, except what we say it is. Uh, well, but yes. Leading interestingly to our point about the Dark Saber, yes. where we end up with Moff Gideon um, surrendering to Din Djarin. Well, yeah. Well, basically, yeah, getting his butt uh, handed to him by Din Djarin. And Din you know, Djarin picks up the saber, and he says, I caught him. Cause it, cause, and, as, and I love as, the line where he stops and goes, Oh, you're going to let me live? Oh, this should be interesting. <laughs> I thought that was great. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Because, but as Cara Dune points out, yeah, it's double the reward if he brings him in alive. Which is, of course, why um, the Mandalorians always try to bring him in alive. Because if you bring him in alive, you get paid double. Yeah, why wouldn't you? Exactly. Um, but then it gets to this whole thing about, you know, well, no, no, she has to take... You, you can't just give it to her. But, and he's like, I don't want it. I don't want a dark it's saber. You. It's yours. Yeah, there you go. Have a, have, have a good day. Um, and I love how much Moff Gideon is enjoying this moment. Oh, yeah. no. She can't just give it to you. She has yeah. to beat you. Although at the same oh. time, why can't he just give it to her? Right. Yeah, yeah. Tell, tell everyone that you again, again, that leads to your point about like power and, and value only exist in things that we give to them. Right, mm-hmm. so if if the truth of the matter is, like he says, the power doesn't come from any supernatural, whatever. It's the narrative and the story that's built behind it, and how much power you give to it is how much allegiance you give to its ideal. Yeah. So if you are able to just take it, then you clearly don't think it has the power that you need it to have. Well, uh, yeah, and I guess that is really the point because really, it, this is about what um, what Bo-Katan, It's not the way. Yeah, exactly. Now she's getting all like, no, no, no. This is, which is, which is, which is funny because, of course, at this whole time, up until this point, you know, he has been very much of his, you know, this is the way and this is what we're going to do and this is how it has to be. And now it's like, well, the, all your people have been saying, you know, do what, do what is right and that be the whole of the law. And right. now that I say, well, take your dang sword, take, take your dang magic sword. I don't need it. I've got a freaking spear. That's cool. <laughs> um, she's, at a, she's at a very interesting crossroads because right from the beginning of the episode, when she says to him, he has something that belongs to me and I will have it and I will rule Mandalore. There's a little twinge of the dark side in her ambitious oh, nature. Yeah. Oh, and, oh. and now now she has to really, like she could hide it before. She could not look at it. She could hide it away in the back of her mind and pretend it isn't there. Pretend she's still superior uh, superior morality wise and that her ethics are still intact and now she has to confront that Din Djarin's already been through Mayfield University and he's graduated he understands yeah. the malleability of your moral code uh, you know if you find something else to belong to and now she has to have this conversation with herself oh what does this mean am I yeah. is the universe speaking is the way speaking through the universe and saying Din Djarin should be the leader of Mandalore do I acquiesce to that do I let go of my ambitions or what do I have to do? It's so interesting. So, so fascinating. And you see uh, her struggle with this and, and 
I wish we had more time to deal with that. But I guess that's the sort of like the amuse bouche they gave us. Me like this is what you got to look forward to before yeah. they're we're rudely interrupted by that X wing. Yes. Well, but you know, good that he showed up. Um, yes, indeed. But I, I, I hope we're. I hope that's not the last we saw of Grogu. Although he does say, "I will visit you." Yeah. And it's it, interesting. Yeah. It's going to be that interesting question. Like you know, has Luke learned the lesson? Maybe let people have familial attachments. You know <laughs> that maybe Yoda was wrong, or or to be more specific, that uh, Obi Wan was wrong. That the smart way to to help um, Anakin would have been to make sure that he could stay in touch with his mom and to have his mom in his life and to do all this. And maybe Grogu should see, you know, uh, Din from every every so often. He should come visit him on the weekends. He should come home for Life Day. You know? <laughs> they should have a big Life Day episode where Din has Grogu come by and he's like a little bit older now and he's got his own little lightsaber. <laughs> An interesting question. Like... Is it possible to work for the greater good if you have too much to protect, too much to be selfish about? Is that the reason you don't have attachments? You know, um, but without it, is there an integral part of being human that you miss out on that without which you can't interpret situations in, in a way that relates to everybody that you're trying to help in a way that you can actually help them? So you're useless to them unless you engage in this part of life. But there are dangers. So I guess the lesson well, is the, the, uh, the way you should go about it is not to eliminate the temptation, but to learn to engage with it in a healthier way. Well, that is, that is to me the whole of the entire Skywalker saga. That when Rey at the end says, I'm a Skywalker, not a Jedi, not a Sith, I'm a Skywalker. And they may still be using the term Jedi colloquially, based on the holiday special we got from Lego. But the fact of the matter is, is that she says at the end, I'm a Jedi. Or she says at the end, I'm a Skywalker. And because... Kind of like she, Boba Fett saying, I'm not a Mandalorian. I'm just, uh, you know, a guy trying to make his way through the galaxy. I exactly. am. Exactly. And But this is the thing. This is what I... This is my opinion. And I was watching actually a, a little CBR uh, thing on YouTube this day about force-sensitive races. And essentially what you have is a lot of force-sensitive races who get pulled to the dark side because essentially once you are a force-sensitive being, you try to control the force. And because you try to control the force, you are inherently damaging you you're 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 interfering with the way the force is supposed to pose you're supposed interfering to with its flow it's like trying to exactly. redirect a river or putting a dam up so you can make electricity exactly and that's going to have downstream consequences and also downstream consequences for you because now 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 things aren't flowing naturally and things aren't you know you're getting the you're getting that joy of of cheap electricity and you're also not caring about the people downstream who now lost their water supply or and also now maybe you're going to use more electricity because hey it's so cheap why not you know and it, it is that idea and there was one race which i thought was really interesting was the race that was super force sensitive and they basically just used it to look into the future and so essentially they got really chill cuz they could see the future so when the empire comes, they're like, "Oh, okay, hi guys. Yeah, now you'll be done. You'll be done in about twenty years, but that's fine. You guys can build your bases. That's fine. We got no problem. We have no interest in your little galactic uh, tit for tat because we can see the time stream and we know all of your all of your bases will come to naught. You know, we know that all of this is it comes to dross in the end, and that's fine." We're just super chill because we can see the time stream. And that was like the one thing that's like, oh, yeah. I kind of feel that that's what Yoda's race is, is that they are these beings that are just – and interesting enough, they weren't even mentioned in the list because I don't think there's enough tridactyls where they can say anything definitively about tridactyls. But my opinion is is that they must be beings that just are so in tune with the Force that it's like, you know, it'd be like someone saying, oh, I've learned that you can blow air out of your lungs and that can push things forward. It's like, yeah, I know, because that's what air does. <laughs> but if you were being that grew up on a planet without air and you suddenly decided, discovered air and air pressure, you'd be like, oh, my goodness, what an amazing force. How can I control this? Yeah, like water uh, on Arrakis in Dune. 
Yeah, exactly. You know? Or anywhere, or in Ice Pirates. Because <laughs> that's the one, that was the one substance that actually did have value. Was water. Anyway. Um, yeah, but in the end, the, uh, the, the Dark Troopers are totally defeated by one, spoiler, Luke Skywalker. <laughs> Because that's who got reached out to. And the second I saw the X-Wing, I was like, oh, I know who owns an X-Wing. <laughs> you know, he's rolling <laughs> up in his 1970s X-Wing, man. <laughs> uh, that's not Wedge Antilles, kids. That's Luke. And, you know, he comes in and he... So, and there's an interesting moment where Moff Gideon gets up and he's terrified of mm-hmm. what he sees on the screen. Does he recognize yeah. who it is, or, or like like Moff Gideon's uh, always in control, even when he's been captured? He's got his little games that he's playing. Uh, but he, you know, th- his puppeteer strings are still intact, and he's still moving pieces. Um, yeah. But now he's completely just like, why is he so afraid? Because he knows that's he he knows who that is. Mm-hmm. Basically, he knows it's either Ashoka Tan mm-hmm. or it's Luke Skywalker, because he knows both are out there. Uh, he knows that Luke does have an X-Wing. You know, everyone knows Luke has an X-Wing. He blew up the, star- the Death Star with it. You know, right. so- And then he turns around and tries to shoot Grogu. Yeah, because his That idea- I thought was interesting, because that's a, of extreme value to the Empire. Why would he try to shoot Grogu? Just for because them to not have it, I guess? Yeah, exactly. It's like, if I can't have it... Even no then, can. wouldn't he think there's a possibility that the Empire can come back and get it? That's so integral to what they're trying to do with making, you know... Their droids Honestly, or sensitive once he sees the X wing, he knows his his story is done. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Like, yeah. like the, here's the thing: he has probably murdered a lot of people. They may still have the death penalty in the in the Republic, hmm. so he may be a dead man already. That is not um that is not something that he wants to risk. And yeah. if he's already a dead man, the one thing he can do for the Empire. Because I can assume that basically, even though he seems so pragmatic, even though he seems Mayfeldian, he's not a Mayfeld. He's not a guy who's just doing this for his own self-aggrandizement. He's doing, you know, you don't rise in the Empire. Right, right, right. If, if If that general on the ship had the loyalty to take the bite of his, you know, electric cyanide pill, um, then he must have displayed that same sort of commitment to the cause to inspire that sort of loyalty. Exactly. So he himself must be terribly committed to the cause. Exactly. And those that don't, those are the ones you can talk Those are the Mayfields. Those are the guys who are like, which the other guy on the ship was more than happy to do. Um, right. And know, he got shot in the back for it. Well, shot in the head. Shot in the face, actually. It's. Uh, no, I, I thought you meant in the beginning where Pershing's uh, two captors, one of them says, hey, I'm not with them. Pop! Right in the back. Oh, yeah, yeah. But the other guy, because um, I'm sure they all have a electro cyanide pill kind of thing. Right. That's so, why I was surprised when Moff Gideon decided to shoot himself as opposed to biting down on his, uh, you know. Uh, well, maybe, maybe when you get to a certain rank, they don't make you have it anymore. I guess. I mean, there's possibilities. I don't know how it works, you know. Maybe maybe if he didn't put it in that day. And I think he also <laughs> wanted to make sure that he, he got Grogu first, you know. Because yeah. um, he does want to kill Grogu. He's, he's still trying to work his angles. And killing Grogu, I think, was his last attempt to find an angle. And then, <laughs> you know. And also we want, we want Moff Gideon to be alive because we want Moff Gideon. We want our Hannibal Lecter scene next season. We have to visit Moff Gideon in the cell. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as long, however long you can have Giancarlo Esposito on your show is how long mm-hmm. you should keep Giancarlo Esposito on your show. Yeah, yeah, you should never blown him up on uh, Breaking Bad. I'm just going to say that right now. Um, Although even then, man, what a beautiful, beautiful scene that was. Oh yeah, he just comes out amazing and like side. deserving of what an amazing character he was. That was a beautiful, beautiful death scene. Yes, it was. It was. Um, but, uh, yeah, I like the, you know, the whole Grogu, uh, Din Djarin scene at the end. Yeah. Where Din Djarin just takes off his helmet and not even, and it's like, you can always see all these, and then here he's like, I don't care about the rules anymore. I don't even know who or what a Mandalorian is anymore. I don't know, I don't know who I am anymore. And it's, um, 
it's kind of your basic uh, Nietzschean idea of slaying the dragon. You know, Nietzsche says that, you know, the dragon is the rules that we've been raised with, and you must defeat the dragon to be the ubermensch. You must go beyond what you were taught to make your own self who you are and to be a fully actualized being. And I think everyone else is still struggling with this. But I think when he takes off his helmet, he is saying, okay, I know I'm more than just the rules I've been taught. And the I funny know part I'm is, more than just a foundling. The thing that brought him to this realization, he's saying goodbye to. Like he's giving yeah. everything up and taking the helmet off, but like the thing that he's taking it all for is taken away from him. So it's like everything and that gave him, that was his new guiding light, you know, to which he could cling to if he was going to let go of this other thing. And now he's standing there with nothing to hold on to. But that's what makes it more, you know, you can, you know, anyone, anyone can, anyone can convert to a new faith. It takes real power to make your own faith. Right. To stand and, at least for a moment in, in uncertainty and nothingness. Well, exactly. And, and the idea is, is that he is coming to that understanding. It's, you know, um, and it's interesting, like, you know, talking about like lily padding from one, you know, place of allegiance to another. Uh, the one thing that I thought was should have been playing really heavily in his mind as he's taking that helmet off. It would have been okay if anybody else saw him take off his helmet. But there's a definite message sent to Bo-Katan. Mm -hmm. He takes his helmet off in front of her. Oh, yeah. It's a graduating to a different level in her eyes. And maybe the next place he finds his allegiance when he's standing with no feet to stand on, uh, no ground to put his feet on, is to say, hey, there's the next lily pad. I can join the other Mandalorians and maybe yeah. – find a different version of myself. Yeah, and and the fanfic's already being written. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's there was a meme I saw, which is like, you know, how to get the dark saber. Uh, face oh, uh, and and death. That, we can't even do that because there's that confrontation in between that. So, ugh. Well, no, but because if they, if they kiss, then it's like she can be, it's like, oh, let me hold your sword for you, honey. Oh, gee. <laughs> and, we're, and we're together. So, you know, look at what we have. We're the power couple. Yeah, we I don't know. I just did I, I did not get any sense of that chemistry between them at all. No, there's not. But the, what I'm saying is, so essentially the argument is, is, is Bo-Katan the kind of person that would like, well, I guess I got to marry him. It's like I can either kill him or marry him. Marry him not, sounds... Not, not, well, maybe not necessarily marry him, but like, you know, <coughs> um, recognize his role in leadership, to be subservient to him. I have to take that yeah. role. Um, well, especially since he doesn't want the job. Right. But, you know... <laughs> but it's, it's like it, like in Gladiator when he says, by gods, that's why it must be you. When he yes. says to um, um, Maximus that he should be ruler simply because he says, with all my heart, no... Yeah, well, exactly. But at the same time, I don't know if that's necessarily true because, you know, the guy who doesn't want it, or, or, or to be more specific, the guy who has no interest in the day to day of the job, they can be good so long as they're willing to let someone else do the hard work. It's like Reagan didn't really care about the day to day. He was up there to make speeches, to wave at people, to go, you know, he was there to be a figurehead, and he wanted to be a figurehead. It was a great job. Mm -hmm. You know, you get to meet the queen, you get to have tea. It's really, it's a good gig. No, and, and, then and, and from a cultural perspective, to sort of guide, um, you know, the identity of a nation. That's a, it's a, yeah. uh, you know, a, a noble pursuit to be looking forward yeah. to. Yeah. It's also a lot of work. It's also very difficult and also maybe not what he wants to do. Right. And I think that's where you get into the conflict because for what it's worth, you know, she's called the princess for a reason because she is the princess of Mandalore. Her sister was the previous ruler of Mandalore before they ran afoul of the Empire and Moff Gideon took her because took her, that was her Darksaber. Um, you know, and the dark saber has gone through several hands. It's just, we'll happily tell you someday. Um, cause it was at one point, Darth Maul was the ruler of Mandalore. At one point, um, Jango Fett was the ruler of Mand Mandalore. And, um, and, th and that has already come to pass before this. Yeah. 
meeting, right? Right, right. So, so when, when they're having their little tiff in the beginning, um, he has already been the ruler of Mandalore. No, that's Boba Fett, not Jango Fett. His dad was, though. Ah, uh, oh, gotcha, and, gotcha, gotcha. And, gotcha. But when he lost the throne, obviously, <laughs> he, he had to do other things. And maybe... Like, so she had to best uh, Jango Fett in order to get no, the Darksaber? No, no. I think someone else beat him. Oh, uh, and then she... Prob- and her, and probably, okay. probably her father... Or maybe, I don't know if, uh, maybe Jango Fett was there and then Darth Maul bested him. Or mm. I'm, No, Darth Maul, I think, gets it at one point. Right. Darth Maul was the head of, was the ruler of Mandalore for a period. And, and, and again, when we're talking about these periods, we're talking about like a 20-year period where this thing is just changing hands. There's, so, so she already has experience after losing the Darksaber to serve under someone else who has what she used to have. Well, she, already she, has never that had, she has never had the Darksaber, I don't think. Oh, didn't Because her sister had the Darksaber. So when she says her it by sister, to me, she just means by right of uh, heir. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> she's, she, she's really always kind of... I mean, she's a great warrior. I'm not going to try and take it away from Bo-Katan in any way. But the fact of the matter is, is like, no, she, she is of the line... She is of she is the next in line by familial accession mm. to wield the dark saber and to be the ruler of Mandalore. But it was really her sister was the queen of Mandalore under under the Empire. So you know, as it goes. Oh, anyway. Yeah, but that is where we leave it. Um Luke gets Grogu, he's gonna take him back to the school and and I actually did think about this Grogu will not be killed by um Anakin? what's his name no not Anakin um no the other guy the other guy uh Han Solo's Kylo? kid Kylo Kylo, Kylo yeah cuz it's implied that Kylo killed a bunch of the other hmm. padawans when he was there much in similar to the way that that Darth Vader did mm-hmm. um but really, if we think about it, Kylo probably isn't born yet. So it's probably going to be another decade before he gets there, which means Grogu will actually have probably become a full Jedi by that point. But still so a baby? Would have already I mean, like he's from- 40 and still a baby, so another 10 years might only be like another couple of months in, in a Grogu's life. Well, no, because based on the way they've done it, it it's pretty clear that Grogu ages. It, it's like... You, you do oh, so when he hits puberty, he'll with a, growth spurt it a little? Exactly. Because already he's vocalized. I'm really sad that we didn't hear him actually say any words. Because, hmm. But he started to vocalize this season. So in one year, he went from being a newborn to suddenly heavily vocalizing. Interesting. To walking, to, to moving, to doing all these hmm. things. And as we saw, as an infant, he was already being trained in the Force. That's true. So basically, from birth, he was already doing this. Hmm. So that's what they're 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 establishing for us. So anyway, um, I'm excited about it. I'm looking forward to the next uh, round of The Mandalorian next year, and, and it's it's extended family of shows as well. Yeah, because we're going to get Rogue Squadron, uh, produced by um, the great Patty Jenkins. Because just because you show, just because a lot of people don't like your movie, doesn't kill your career. Um, right, especially since you've made so many good ones before. Yeah, and at the end of the day, I'm sorry. I think that I do. We're going to talk about this. We're going we're gonna to talk about it later. You'll probably hear it before this. But Wonder Woman is not a bad film. It's not as bad as people are saying it is. It is a film you have to watch more than once. Okay. I mean, I, it. it, it I'm still. I'm not saying it's a good it's, film. It's, it's it's lazy storytelling, and uh, you know, I think actually, I see. I think it's the exact opposite. Where I think she, that. I mean, again, it, it's a matter of perspective where you're standing, where you're looking hard. from. Um, I just think that the, the concept of at, just wishing your wish away and that being the resolution to the story is so cheap. And the fact, look, it's a, it's. Have, it, yeah, I understand. Like, the, I mean, the, I. I where they wanted to end up and what they were trying to say and set up. And that's all well and good, but you could have done it better. I mean, I can see that. I can definitely see that. What I will say is I think that, um, and we'll talk about this tonight. Um, what I think it, the idea is, is that if you're going to suspend disbelief enough to have 
part of the story be magical wishing rocks. That once you establish that, oh yeah, and the MacGuffin is a magical wishing rock, which, you know, to be fair, is the same MacGuffin in Endgame, is we have to get the magic rich wishing rocks, and then then we can unwish the wish. It's literally the kind of the exact same thing. Right, but it was done much way. more cleverly, much with a much, much yeah. more nuanced and deft hand, to the point where the consequences yeah. mattered, and, and or, the... Or, to, the uh, reversing of of the initial conflict was done in a way that felt difficult. That felt uh, like they earned their resolution yeah. by fighting, by giving something up. Here, it was just like we get to the end, and it's just like, oh, nobody in the entire world thought, hey, maybe I'll just say I take my wish back. And then, with the immediate dire consequences of every single wish yeah. made, that that occurred to nobody is is beyond what I'm willing to suspend. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that that part is good, although I will say it is very comic booky. So I keep on going back and forth on this between praise and, and damnation with regard to it. And we'll talk about this tonight, but I, I do feel that she wanted to embrace very silver agey and golden agey storytelling ideas, much Did in the same like way that. Was- a wide departure from the last film and the atmosphere of the last no, film? No, no, not in any way. I actually think it is, I think it is, I think it is actually exactly the same film. Interesting. I think everything that people are going to claim about it is exactly, that. every derogatory aspect you might want to say about it is in place in the first film. Um, from the hydrogen gas gag, which always bugged me. The hydrogen is that, so. Like, if we're gonna say we can overlook hydrogen gas, I think we can overlook a lot of stuff. I, I don't think they're in the same league. No, hydrogen gas was stupid because hydrogen. No, no. The whole reason granted, why it works is because it's a small molecule, and having a molecule, but it does, it's not a small molecule once you make it poisonous. And also, hydrogen because it's a small molecule that makes it float. So if you make it small enough so that you add, so if you made you know um, hydrogen sulfide, which isn't actually a po- poisonous gas, um, so it'd be small enough to get through a gas mask, it's actually still going to be lighter than air. Um, and actually, I think hydrogen sulfide actually is used in mustard gas anyway, so it actually wouldn't get past the gas mask. So it's it, it, there's there's all these things. Uh, I guess you could make hydrogen cyanide. Hydrogen cyanide might work. Um, Sounds like it would. Yeah, hydrogen cyanide might work, but I think it also would be a lighter than air gas. So, um, yeah, hydrogen sulfide is more deadly, but I think hydrogen uh, cyanide. Because hydrogen cyanide is what they use, if I remember correctly, what they use in gas chambers. Um, Because they drop the cyanide tablets into water, the hydrogen molecules bond to it, it becomes a gas. It floats up, and you breathe it, and then you die of cyanide. uh, Huh. Cyanide gas. If I I recall correctly, that's, that's how a modern cyanide gas chamber works. Wow. And, um... It's hydrogen cyanide. And yes, you could make hydrogen cyanide, but it also wouldn't work well for trench warfare because the gas is going to rise, not fall, which is what you want for trench warfare so that gas gets into the into right. thing. But anyway, but that's, <laughs> that's Wonder Woman 1. And I do think that that and other things happen in Wonder Woman 1. That, you know, again, you have the same kind of things in Wonder Woman 2. It's just that, you know, I think people are, I think that there was a lot that was that they were relying on the audience to pick up on in the film that I think a lot of people just went too quickly to see, and they didn't. I think I think I think, it was it's, I think it was there to pick up on. It was picked up too easily. That's what I think. Mm-hmm. I think all those things are there, but it was just like thrown in your face, like, "Hey, buy this and buy this and buy this." You know, it, was, it felt like infomercially with how much, you know, it's, it's like there was no nuance yeah. to it. That's the problem I had. I got the and point that's, that's a fair argument. And, and all the crumbs they were laying, but, you know, it, it wasn't done yeah, very but We're not talking about that. We're, t- we're going to talk about that in about, right. in about an hour. Um, so right now, uh, any final thoughts on The Mandalorian, Maz? Uh, the one thing I, I really appreciated was the whole time I've been watching this, the one parallel uh, that I can't help but make is that I constantly see Master Chief from the Halo games 
whenever I'm looking at uh, Mandalorian because he also wears this helmet. He's also like, you know, a really good fighter and a warrior and he could take down, you know, uh, legions of men and, and he never takes off his helmet either. And so with this final episode, there was a couple of scenes there that seemed like, and the fact that they put TPS reports as an homage to office space, I thought was really, really cool. So it lends me to believe that some of the things that felt to me uh, like scenes from the original Halo game might have been there intentionally. Like when, when the soldiers are coming in, when the X-Wing is coming in to uh, dock in that uh, exit port, a lot of those scenes look like scenes from the original Halo game. And then there's one little bit of dialogue where it says, negative, negative, we're under attack. It, was, it, it felt like it was right out of a scene in the original Halo where you're waiting for uh, a pickup and, and she can't pick you up because they're under attack. And that bit of language sounded exactly like Cortana saying, negative, negative, we're under attack. Um, yeah, so I thought it was really cool that they threw some Halo references in there. Well, I'm sure that is 100% what they were trying to do. You know, for what it's worth, I think that, you know, one thing that the Disney machine does is it gives creators a place to play, you know? They say, yeah, you want to do this, do that. You want to do that, do this, you know, go ahead. We're not going to, you know, so long as people keep on watching the show, we don't care what you do, you know, don't make it too dirty because we're going to have kids watching it. But if you can keep it not right. being too dirty, we're going to let you go with it, you know. And I think, you know, that's what you get with Soul and everything else and all these other great bits of media that Disney is producing right now because they're looking at the creators and saying, well, what do you guys want to do? You know, you, you're you the professional creators. You, we hired you to write this stuff. Tell us what you're going to write, you know? Yeah. If we think that, you know, we're, if we're going to be, you know, they're going to stand lit. They're going to say, well, you know, we're, we're going to have some editors here and we're going to sit here. We're going to pull you back if we need to. But the fact of the matter is we're hiring you to do the work, you know? We're not hiring you to tell you what story to tell. We're hiring you to tell the story. And I think that is where Disney is doing well. And I think that that's where, you know, the other the other company, Warner's, is, is probably having some trouble. Although I actually think Warner's is learning that lesson. Again, <laughs> everyone's mileage may vary. I actually have faith, and I'm a real optimist. I'm thinking they're gonna do it. You watch. Um, but well, the I'm, only the only place where I do have some opti- optimism and some hope is with this uh, dark DC universe with the Joker and the, the the new Batman film with Robert Pattinson. I'm super excited for it. A lot of people are not so excited, or they're excited that Ben Affleck is coming back to do his version of Batman. I could care less. I'm super excited to see Robert Pattinson's Batman, and I want to see that yeah. universe continue. I'm I'm excited to see what they're going to do next because I think they are trying. I think there's someone at DC who's trying to figure out what to do next. Yeah, and I think that more than anything else is what's important is to have someone. You know, this is what I'll always say. You we know didn't who know who is? Kevin Feige was until no. But we didn't know who Kevin Feige was before he was Kevin Feige. Indeed. He was just some guy from Disney. He was a producer. And he was, yeah, he's the producer. Right? This guy named Kevin Feige. I don't know what he does. You know. And, I, I, but th- he's I think the guy just hire out, Favreau. Oh. <laughs> you know, Disney has got that, got that secret sauce locked up. They're not, nope, nope, yeah. nope. <laughs> we got plenty of work for you, sir. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> You've been. Although that would be nice to see someday his hand at that to see what he could create. I think you cut out again, Charlie. <clears throat> All right. You know, that a creative created it and built it mm. and never lost sight of the fact that we're here to tell stories. That's a, literally right. our job. We're not right. here to just make money because we make money by telling stories and we don't tell good stories. It's like, you know, if someone said, oh, you know, what? we could sell more. We could could make Twinkies cheaper cheaper if we just made them out of sawdust. It's like, well, yes, but they're not going to be Twinkies anymore. They're not going to taste good and no one will buy them. So it's just, you know. Oh, uh, looks like I lost you all together, Charlie. Hopefully we can get you. There you are. There we are. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know if you got my Twinkie rant there, but yeah, we're yeah, yeah. we we got we got we got the the Twinkie made made a sawdust. But like, I think with I think with DC, I think they started off uh, making with sawdust and not realizing it. Yeah. Well, you know, the problem was I think that first they, you know, and it's it's the Stan Lee effect. You know, you can give a creator free reign, mm-hmm. and a creator will create. But a creator won't always create good things. You need an editor to come in and say, you know what? Here's what works in your story. Here's what doesn't work. So let's write this so that it works. 
so that we can get your story across, but we're not going to, you know, there's a reason why Stan Lee always wrote the words after they, after Jack Kirby drew the pictures. Because often Stanley had to say, okay, now I've got to make this make sense. <laughs> Jack drew a lot of pictures, and then it's not the story we wanted to tell. So let me just have, let me just have our characters explain it in a way that makes more sense. That's funny. So, well, you know, that's the thing. Everyone always wants to, you know, take away from Stanley, but it's like, you know, no, man, he's the guy writing the words. He's the guy putting in the script and saying, here's what they say, and here's how right. we make all these pictures make sense. And that I think is what, I think that's what Marvel has in Kevin Feige. I think what Star Wars is right now having with maybe Patty, uh, not Patty Jenkins, um, Christine Sullivan and, is it Christine Sullivan? It's, I know her last name is Sullivan. Um, and John Favreau. I think that these people are building up, I think they're letting the creatives build what they have, but there's always someone there who's trying to steer it within the canon. Hmm. I do think, Based on the latest Wonder Woman, I think there is someone who is helping Patty see where she should go next. And I think she accomplished her job, and that's why she got Wonder Woman 3. Because I think I think Wonder Woman 2 is going to make more sense later. I hope so. Yeah, I, and that's that, that's my thing. It's sort of like, you know, when everyone's, you know, when they go back, you know, when, when you get to Endgame and they're revisiting all the films that, like, oh, yeah, you thought Thor 2 was bad? Well, actually, here's how it fits into no, things. but, yeah. You Thor, thought Thor, Iron Man 2 was bad? Here's how that fits into things. I, I, Iron Man 2 and Iron Man and, and Thor 2 put together were nowhere near as bad as this movie was. Yeah, you know, and again, I don't think, I, I don't think any of those movies were bad. Right, that, that's, that's my difference. point. I thought this was bad. I didn't think any of the... The only one I could say that was bad was Iron Man 3, and even that, I would rather watch that again than watch yeah. this movie. Here's what I'll say is I think that a lot of the times, um, especially with this film, I think the longer it sits with me, the more ang- the more upset I get about things, but I think hmm. when I'm watching it, I enjoy it. Hmm. And I think that's the, that's the goal for a good movie. I mean, I think every movie breaks apart when you watch it, when you think about it. Yeah, but but yeah, well, you know, uh, you know that's the thing. No, I, mean, I think Endgame is kind of stupid when you actually think about it, but it makes sense in the moment when yeah. you're watching it. You know, right. that's and, the and thing. It's, yeah, that's a, that's the piece I missed. Yeah, well, and like I said, that's why I think I think what had happened with me is when I went to do the rewatch with uh, Wonder Woman, and with my criticisms, I was able to see. Okay, do they answer my criticism? And I go, oh, okay, that's where they answer my criticism. So yeah, because see, my criticism wasn't with whether or not the plot worked out or not. It was like you know the decisions you made before you even started making the movie. Yeah, so like you you actually gonna be, you, you have know, a problem with the MacGuffin, and there's nothing that's yeah. going to solve the MacGuffin. That's a that's a MacGuffin problem, right? And what you but like MacGuffins for. can be handled well. They just <clears throat> well, they handled a MacGuffin with a MacGuffin. It, it was almost yeah. like you know it was like. You but can it, choose to do this route, but you got to do it really cleverly, cle- cleverly to make it work. Uh, and if you fail at that, then then it wasn't worth doing. Yeah, what I will say is, I think that a lot of times the MacGuffin works if you are, you know, the 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 idea of the MacGuffin is that it needs to be. Um, you need to not think about it too much while you're watching it. And I think this is, and again, this is the problem when it gets released streaming rather than in the movies. I think that basically a lot of the problems with this film have to do with the fact that it was released streaming rather than in the movie theaters. I think if you see it in a theater, it's going to be a different experience. The spectacle would carry you through the suspension of disbelief? Exactly, exactly. I think that just the idea that if you can stop it and go to the bathroom, while you're going to the bathroom or when you're getting a beer out of the fridge, you're you're going to have your fridge logic. You're going to have that moment where you think, wait a minute, why is that happening this way? Yeah. yeah. Or, or, or just the fact that you're so wowed by this big tank fight that you're able to suspend disbelief a little bit easier. Exactly. Whereas if you don't get that emotional burst, then it, then you're too critical and you're still thinking too much rather than being uh, buoyed the, by the, the yeah. yeah. I don't think there's any film, any part of the film that really pulled me out of it. That's just me. I don't think there's. I was laughing the whole way through, incredulous, going, "Oh, really? Oh, what?" Like, well, but you know, I but maybe that's a selling point too. I mean, sometimes you have to be willing to turn your brain off to watch a superhero film. You, you have to say, you know what? It's a film about superheroes. Uh, Just in that, in, in that idea that oh, here are people with uh, fantastic abilities baked in. So it's like you know what? Maybe we should, you know, 
it's what I always say. It's like, you know, you can't say that it's unrealistic that computers can do this because clearly in this universe they can. Like you can't, you, 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 you can't say, you can complain when something is internally not logical, but you can say, um, you can't say, oh, well, you know, a computer couldn't really go that fast or a computer couldn't do that thing. It's like, well, no, maybe they, they here computers are different. And when you're dealing with a super science world to start with, because we know that this is a super science world in general, they already have a override technology beam. Yeah. You know, um, clearly that means that there's a super science in this universe already. So yeah, you yeah. have to suspend all disbelief about super science. Hey, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad people were able to find enjoyment in it. Yeah. Yeah, some people did. A lot yeah. of people, not so much. So yeah. um, <laughs> that's that. Okay, Maz. Uh, you know, Maz, uh, we've been having some audio difficulties in this. Um, a lot of it's on my end. Um, uh. You know, but, you know, I think if, if it is on other people's end, they could probably solve that if they just went to tweakedaudio.com, use the coupon code SOUTHGATE to get a discount on high-quality uh, audio equipment to listen to our podcasts. Likewise, they can then take that same coupon code SOUTHGATE Go to huntakiller.com uh, and get a discount on their product, which is essentially an escape room delivered to your house where you help Michelle Grace solve a cold case. It's a lot of fun. You and the whole family can enjoy it. Uh, likewise, if you don't aren't interested in that but still want to help out the show, go down to our show notes, click on the Amazon link, go to Amazon, buy whatever the heck you feel like. It doesn't cost you anything. It helps out the show because they know that, oh, you were listening to our show before you went here. And so, hey, we'll make sure that we give these guys some money. Um, do that, and while you're there, check out Pod Life, the book. That's the book written by the Southgate Media Group family about podcasting and why we do it. It's available both in digital download for your Kindle or other device, or just in a nice handy-dandy paper paperback in case there is an apocalypse and digital devices no longer work. All right, Moz. In the meantime, how can people find you if they'd like to find you? Oh, they can email me at mozmanzor at gmail.com or find me on Facebook under Moz Manzor. That's M-O-Z-Z-M-A-N-Z-O-O-R. And, of course, you can always write to me in that old-fashioned email way that we are Moz and Paz once said at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog, all one word, at gmail.com. And, of course, follow me on the Facebook. No, follow me on the Twitter. That's the one. As I live tweet... DuckTales of Woohoo in their final season at Charlie S here. That's C H A R L I E S S E R. Look for the two E's in the middle. Quality. Ding. Thank you, Maz. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen. All right, me hearties. You have come through us for one more season of The Mandalorian. Come and abort us next week. And we'll be doing our next show, and I don't know what it is yet, because me and Maz will talk about that later. But join us on Full Stream Ahead. Arr.